Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you want to have a more effective prayer life? Now, I hope your answer is yes, indeed. Because a wise person in the spiritual knowledge, he will always know that prayer is foundational. There's nothing that we can do that's pleasing to God if it is not founded in pleasing prayer. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms. And now we're ready for Psalms 4. The book of Psalms and Psalm 4. Now here, David's going to be teaching us and notice something about this psalm. If you look at the inscription, now in some Bibles, it's verse 1. In others, it will be placed over verse 1. But it's very important, I'm going to say this frequently, that we understand it is Scripture. And when we look at this inscription, it says, Le Matseach, which is to the chief musician. It's to the one that's going to be leading. And this tells us something. This was a psalm that people would recite in unison, together. And the reason for that is it contains things that, in a more public way, God wanted it to be shared with individuals. So we read in verse 1, to the chief musician on the niginot. Now, what is that? Well, this is a instrument. Many will say a string instrument. It comes from the Hebrew word to play an instrument. So this is this term called neginot, and it could be a few types of instruments, or it's in the plural because it has multiple strings. But notice it says, Mizmor le David, a psalm of David. And in this psalm, notice how it begins. This is verse 2 in Hebrew, perhaps verse 1 in your Bible. David is is speaking, and he says, When I call, and this is calling out prayerfully to God. And don't we want God to respond to these petitions, these supplications, these requests? When we call, certainly we want to be heard. And David says here, when I call, answer me. And notice what he says in whom he is addressing. Because he just doesn't say, O Lord or God, but he says here in verse 2, he says, God, my God, or the God of my righteousness. Now, two things need to be pointed out here. First of all, David's God is a righteous God. And David intercedes. David wants God in his life for righteous purposes. Now, this is why I am so opposed to these prosperity teachers. Now, is God against prosperity? No, in fact, God's the source oftentimes of prosperity. But the problem is when we think, This is all that God's interested in. And I'm on a few networks where there's other individuals. Sometimes I'll turn it on, and it seems as though all they talk about is how you can find prosperity, and that prosperity always involves writing them a check, sending them money, or something along those lines. Now, here's the truth. If we're interested in prosperity. That prosperity is always connected to the will of God. And that prosperity always is within a a containment of 
righteousness. If it doesn't contain righteousness, it is not a spiritual, a true, a factual prosperity. So David says here, God, I'm calling to you. God, I want you to answer. And he says here that you are the God of my righteousness. Now, what does it tell us? It tells us that above all, God moves in a person's life for the purpose of righteousness. And David is wanting to connect with God. He's wanting to hear from God in order that David, that he could be righteous. And he realizes that is never possible without a relationship with the God of Israel. Notice he says in this verse, God of my righteousness. And why is that important? Because if someone's God isn't producing a biblical definition of righteousness, that's not the God of Israel. And that's why Islam, when it speaks about Yeshua, that is Jesus, they do not speak, they do not address the righteous king. They do not speak of him in a factual manner. Same thing with God. That's why these individuals that say you can use Allah for, for the name God, you cannot. Because Allah has a totally different purpose, description, attributes, character, and he has nothing to do with righteousness. And of course, he was a, a creation of man's uh, figmentation, so obviously he is false. Let's press on to, to the second part. Now, if you don't look at this in the original language, you're going to miss out on a couple things. First of all, this word here, which is translated probably in most Bibles, trouble or perhaps distress, it is the word sar. And sar is something which is narrow. The idea here with this word sar is pressure, stress, anxiety. You feel things just caving in, pressing in upon you, and you're under stress. Now, when David uses this second word, it's the word hir chafta. Hir chafta is a word, the word rachav is with. It comes from the, the verb to make wide. So David says, basically, in times of distress, when I'm experiencing trouble, when I am full of anxiety, stress, pressure, what does he say? You, God, you broaden, you give me space. And it's a word of, of being in a position whereby you don't feel all the world, all these things pressing in upon you. Lots of times you hear the expression, I want to get out of the city. You want to go someplace in the countryside where you have lots of room. So this is the, the idiom that David is speaking about, the expression that he's using. So in times of distress, he says, you, you brought me, you give to me that space I require. And then he says, be gracious unto me. And this is important because the only way that we can really, and this is a, a great principle, you're feeling stress, anxiety, pressure. What should you seek? Chen. Chen is one of the, the Old Testament words, Hebrew words for grace. There's a word chesed as well, but, but chen. And chen allows me to function Properly. That's the difference. Grace, this word chesed, is what God supplies to heal this relationship so that I have salvation, forgiveness of sins, etc., etc. But the word chen is a word relating to grace that, that shows me, equips me to function properly. And when we think about chesed and chen, these two words for grace, the purpose is that the will of God can become realized in my life and the blessings of God that I can once again hope for. So David says here,
Be gracious unto me and hear my prayer. So let me ask you a question. Are your prayers for righteousness? Are your prayers so that you can, can conquer, overcome the stress, the pressures, pressures, the anxiety, the grief of this world? And do you pray, are you seeking God's grace so that you can function correctly in this world for the things of God, for the will of God? So if you don't have that mindset, that, that objective, then your prayers aren't going to be effective. It is going to be like speaking to a wall. Verse 3, we have the expression B'nai Ish. B'nai Ish means sons of a man. It's in the plural, sons of a man. And these individuals from the context, from the context, they are, are speaking and behaving to David in a way the commentators, in fact, I wrote down here, those who uh, uh, mock me, meaning mock David. So David is speaking about these individuals that are mocking him, and he says, Adme. Now, Adme, if you look in the commentators, they will give you a, a different expression to understand that, and that is Ad Matai. Adme is until what? Admetai is until when? And until when, traditionally, it's understood as a call, a petitioning for the, the kingdom to come, the messianic age. The, the term Adme, although it's related, it's basically what's got to happen for that kingdom. Not when is it coming, but what will bring it about? So he says, Ad me, until when is my glory? How long is my glory going to be in shame? And what he's speaking about here is these who, who are mocking him, these individuals, and it's true. I mean, this is how humanity responds. Humanity mocks the things of God. Humanity when we are not under the authority of God, we will rebel against authority. Now, when this is being recorded, we are seeing in the United States, and it has spread to, to Europe and other places, this, this demonstrations, and, and perhaps the demonstrations, some of them are certainly warranted and necessary when individuals abuse authority and motivated by, by hate or simply a delight in the sufferings of others or perhaps motivated in bigotry and racism, yes, people need to, to speak out and demonstrate strongly against that. But the problem is that that is being hijacked by a spiritual uncleansingness. And what do I mean by that? Well, what you see here is not simply saying we want righteous authority, but, but it's turned into we, we don't want any authority. So this is how the enemy takes something which is good and turns it into evil. A call for we want righteous authority, we want good authority, to we don't want any authority. And this is what oftentimes takes place. People don't want to submit, but look at the scripture. We read here, David is saying, until when is my glory? That is, when is behavior? that is rooted in the truth of God, when is it going to stop being shamed and mocked and it's going to be honored? And he says, here's the problem. These individuals, remember how it begins, B'nai Ish. These children of a men, it's just an idiom for people, humanity. It says, they love. What do they love? They love, and he speaks to them personally, you love, reek. 
What is reek? Reek comes from the Hebrew word reek, which is empty. It's, it's also a word for vanity or futile. So here's the problem. The sons of men, humanity, when we move away from godly authority, and I'm not speaking here in a political sense, I'm speaking in a spiritual sense. When individuals say, I don't want to be under God's authority, I want to do what is right to me, I'll define right and wrong. When people do that, you know what they, they love? Now, the term love is a word of sacrifice. It's a word of committed commitment. And these individuals, they are committed. They are making individual personal sacrifice. But you know what's going to come to? Reek. What is that? Nothingness. All these things, and this is why, remember Gamaliel? He was a wise individual on the Sanhedrin. And, and he spoke about the movement of the Messianic believers 2,000 years ago. And he says, you know what? If it's not of God, eventually it will come to nothing. And this is what we're going to see. And let me share to you that if you are building your life, you are pursuing those things that are not pleasing to him, not part of his will, not under his authority, not based for righteousness, then all of your sacrifice, all of your effort, it is going to come to nothing. He says, you seek, still again speaking to humanity in a very personal way, he says, you seek chazav. What's chazav? Falsehood. And this tells us a lot. It tells us that these individuals... They are against David. They are bringing distress, hardship to him. But in the end, you know what they are following? They're all about a lie, a falsehood, Selah. Verse, verse 4 in the, the Hebrew. He says, they know, or simply know that the Lord if la chasid lo. No, it's a commandment. You need to know this, in other words. And what do we need to know? That the Lord makes a distinction. Now, the word here in, in Hebrew is the word hifla. And I wrote the word aflaya. Why? Aflaya is the modern Hebrew word for, for discrimination. And it just comes from the word to discriminate. And sometimes discrimination has to do with something, as we alluded to, alluded to earlier, racism. And that discrimination is a, a stench in the nostrils of God. It's from the pit of hell. When someone looks at someone and based upon an ethnic background or a, a racial background, they, they have feelings negative feelings well this is simply the word it's derived from a similar root but this has to do with with discriminating in the sense of discerning something making a distinction and what the scripture saying is this god god makes a a distinction he shows a different behavior for those who are what chasid lo those who, and here's the word for grace, and it's a word not chesed, but chesed. What's the difference? And chesed is someone who has received grace. And they receive the grace from him, and now they're for him. So when someone receives God's grace, and they want to use that grace for him, for his purposes, God is going to mark that man. He is going to discern. He is going to see that woman in a distinct, a separate, a different way. So he speaks here about that. And therefore, what can we expect? Remember, we began by talking about making your prayers more effective. It says, and the Lord, he will hear my calling out unto him. Why? Well, because I have made myself distinct to him. 
I have caused myself to be recognized by him by receiving his grace and utilizing that grace for him, for his purposes. And when that is our objective, it makes our prayers more effective. Verse, verse 5 in, in the Hebrew text. Rigzu ve'al tehteu, which means uh, be angry, but do not sin. And, and this is what I would say about so much of the problems of the world, whether it's, it's racism, whatever it might be. It, it's okay, and this word uh, can also mean to make a noise. It is a word of being upset and, and not being able just to sit still, tranquil when this is going on. So it's fine, and we can put this in the sense of protests. But it says, be angry, but do not sin. Don't allow the enemy to use that anger, perhaps a righteous indignation. Don't allow the enemy to, to pervert that into something that's displeasing to God and brings about sinful behavior. So we all struggle with this. We might have a justification for being angry, but don't allow that anger to produce sin as its outcome. That's what he's saying here. It says, rather, you shall say in your hearts. Now, heart has to do with a mindset, a frame of mind. And therefore, we need to understand that there are inputs. We're going to see things. We're going to experience things, be the recipients of things. And what he says here is when that happens, realize that we need to take that to prayer. It says, say in your hearts, upon your, your beds. So at night when you're laying down, you need to be conditioning your mind to think properly. And to do that, to be still, then he says, selah. Which, which we do not know the, the word for that or the meaning of that word selah. But what he's telling us here in, in before that word, he says, you need to meditate in your heart. Be still and think before you behave. Verse 6. What should we do to also impact our prayers? Well, it says here, zivchu zivche sedek. Offer up sacrifice, a righteous, righteous sacrifices. So giving, and this is a, an expression of worship, but sacrificial worship, offer up righteous offerings and, and trust in the Lord. Put your confidence, and it's the word not in, because we usually have the expression, bitru be'ashem, trust in. But this is not the word in, be, but it's the word el too. So, so move what you're trusting in, move that trust to the Lord. All too often, what the scripture is saying is that we're believing, we're trusting, we're hoping. We, we are invested in the wrong thing. It's not that we're lazy. It's not that we're not wanting to, to do the right thing, but we're not doing the right thing because we, we have invested in the wrong thing. We need to take that investment, that effort, those thoughts, those behaviors, and we need to move them to the Lord. Verse, verse 7. Many say, who will show him good? Who? Many are saying, who's the one that's going to show him good? Now, what's good? I hope you know the answer to that. The will of God. Who is going to make manifest to him goodness? But that goodness is related to the will of God. So how can we experience that which is good? Well, he tells us. At the end of this verse, he says, Nesa Alenu, lift up upon us the light of your face, O Lord. Now, we all know the Aaronic, the Birkat Kohanim, the Aaronic blessing, where we say, uh, the Lord, uh, may he, he bless me and keep me. May he make his face to shine upon me. That term, to make his face, this, this illumination, 
of God looking upon it. The Lord is light. So when the Lord looks upon me, it's as though light, his light, shines. And when his light shines upon me, it's an expression for blessing. So who's going to make goodness in my life? Well, it comes, what he's saying here in this expression, it comes through the light of the Lord being placed upon you. How do we understand that? It is a blessing, the will of God. So if I want goodness, I need God's illumination. I need his truth. I need him to light up my life so that I can see things properly, not live in darkness, but live in the illumination of his truth, that I can see things from his perspective so that I can do his will, and that brings about goodness in my life. Verse, verse 8, here again in the Hebrew text, probably verse 7 in English. Natanta, you have given or you have set, and then we have a suffix. And that suffix probably relates to the, the light of his face, face, that blessing. For you have placed this light, this blessing, and therefore, notice what he says, simcha be libi. That has brought about the gladness, the happiness in my heart. Now, notice what we need to, to realize. I want righteousness. I want to, to utilize God's grace so that I can fulfill his objective to behave properly according to his will. And when I do that, when I'm interested in his goodness, then I'm going to realize I need his illumination to, to be a blessing in my life so that, notice what it says, so that the goodness, his goodness, and his gladness, happiness comes into my heart. And that is better, he says, me'et diganim, or here, diganam ve'tirosham rabu. It is better than, than the time of their grain and their new wines in abundance. So what the scripture is saying is this. People would rejoice over a abundant harvest. The time of an abundant harvest when they bring in their grains and bring in their wine. Joy. And what he's saying is that the joy that God puts in my heart from doing his will, which is an outcome of God's illumination, which is an outcome of his grace. It begins with grace, but also a righteous desire. And that's why I say if someone's not interested in the will of God, they're really not a candidate for salvation. It's only when I say, I want your will, what does that mean? I want to turn away from sin. I want to stop doing my will. I want to stop seeking those things that delight my flesh. And the only way I can do that is through your grace. And your grace functions in my life in order that I can see things, first of all, from your perspective. I can pursue your will. I can be in your will, and that's where the goodness is. And it's that goodness that brings that joy into my heart. And it's better, it's a greater joy than the time of the harvest, the grain harvest, and receiving that new wine in abundance. Verse, verse 9, the, the last verse. Be shalom yachdav. Shalom is a word peace, but it's also, and I've heard, you've heard me say this many times, related to the fulfillment of God's will. So together with that, it's going to bring joy, the fulfillment of God's will. And notice one of the outcomes David is saying here. I will lay down and I will sleep. It talks about him in this passage, laying down and being given sleep. In other words, shalom, he's got no concern. Now, David had problems in his life, but those problems didn't consume him. They were not problems that overtook his life and caused that stress, anxiety, fear, giving priority to these things to, to, to turn him away from the things of God. No, David realized when he focused upon the righteous will of God, 
taking hold of the grace of God, wanting the illumination of God and the blessings of God. It gave to him peace together with a good night sleep. And he says, last part, for you alone are Lord. That's such a great statement. What he's saying, ki ata Hashem lebadad. For you are Lord alone. What he's saying is this. In actuality, there's nothing else than we need but the Lord. If the Lord is with me, I have it all. And this is seen in the New Testament verse, if God did not withhold his only begotten son, how much more together with him that he'll give to us all things. When I have Yeshua, I have the Lord. And when I have the Lord, what else do I need? I mean, if he's willing to get involved in our life, he is willing to do everything to give us that joy, as he spoke about in the earlier verse, that joy within our heart. So he says, you, for you, O Lord, are everything. It's you alone. And therefore he says, and for trust. It's the word, le vetach. Le vetach, and for trust. Trust. You have set me down, meaning this. He came, when this scripture begins, notice the first phrase of it. When we get into David's petition about wanting to be, be answered, he's talking about sorrow, all that trouble, anxiety. David does not like where he's at, but he says, God, you are everything. You alone are God. You're the Lord Almighty. And it's you, O oh Lord, I trust in you. And you give me security where you place me. Now, I'm going to close with this. One of the wisest prayers that you can pray, and it's so simple. God, I trust in you that you will position me, that you will lay me down where I need to be. It's simply recognizing that when we trust God, we're going to be placed in his will. And when we don't trust God, you know what that says? We don't want to be in his will. We want something else. So my opinion is that when we study this fourth psalm, we learn so much about having an, an effective prayer life, and it's that effective prayer life that is going to make our life effective for righteousness, for the will of God, and the outcome of that is going to be a joy that, that, that gives us a peace, a peace, a contentment, one that's not rooted in anything but the fact that it's God that lays me down and he gives me his rest. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.